Hello and welcome to this first Tonight at 8. Soon we'll be finding out how to put one of these Raspberry Pi microcomputers to great use. But first, a short message from the Chairman of the Board of the RSGB, Ian Shepherd, G4EVK. Good evening. I'm Ian Shepherd, G4EVK, Chairman of the RSGB. We're all experiencing personal challenges in these unusual times and finding ways to integrate are proving difficult. The Society has been very proactive over the last few weeks with a number of projects such as Get On The Air To Care, the Hope QSO parties and others, keeping the members involved and informed and to generate feelings of belonging. And this is our latest initiative. Welcome to this presentation, the first in a series of interactive presentations from both previous RSGB convention speakers and live presentations on a wide range of topics. Questions are invited during the online stream and these will be answered during or after the presentation. We hope you enjoy the series and that it inspires you to do even more with Amateur Radio. So without further ado, I'll hand you over to our host for the evening's presentation. Thank you very much, Ian. Shortly, I'll be introducing our guest presenter for the evening, Mike Richards, G4WNC, who's going to be showing us some of the ways that the Raspberry Pi computer can be used with amateur radio. But first, just to remind you that this is live, so you can interact with Mike during and straight after his talk with questions and comments if you're watching on the BATC stream at batc.org.uk forward slash live forward slash RSGB. If you're not already signed into a BATC account, you can comment as a guest just by typing forward slash Nick and then your call sign and first name into the bottom comment box. You can find full instructions on the page. And also please note that you can also make this video stream fill your screen on most devices, usually by double clicking on the picture or clicking on the full screen button. I'll leave reading out most of your questions and comments until the end. Although if there are any which we feel need to be read to Mike during the presentation, I will do so. But now, it gives me great pleasure to introduce you to Mike Richards, G4WNC. Over to you, Mike. Thank you. And um, you should be able to see me now. That well, We oh, could. Got feedback. <laughs> but it was okay, and now that's it. That we got you fine. We can see you fine. Jolly good. It, I was uh, sharing my screen with video on it. <laughs> well, um, I'm quite honoured to be the first person to do the uh, Tonight at Eight uh, broadcast, so I hope I can live up to it. So um, I've got a slide presentation which I'll run through, but we're jumping out to a few demonstrations. And as David said, if you've got um, any questions, please feel free to uh, type them in as you go. Uh, if there's a lot of questions, I may have to answer them afterwards and take them away, but um, I still will answer them all, so that should be good. So the next step is to get my slideshow running, like so, and here, excuse me while I bumble about, that should be... <laughs> That's the end of my slideshow. That's what happens when you check your slides before you This start. is live, as we've said, Mike. So this proves <laughs> it, doesn't it? Yep. So here we go. So you know the ending. Now we'll start at the beginning. <laughs> we haven't seen the picture yet, by the way. So we're still seeing you. So you need to share oh, yeah. your screen. Yep. Okay. And dink. No, nope, that's not got it, has it? No, okay. we're still seeing you. Yeah. This doesn't Share happen in a screen. conference room, does it? <laughs> ah. No. Right. Now, I think we can just, if you can lose that big picture and then we just can see the rest of your screen. We did see your computer screen momentarily. Oh, did you? Right. Just okay. then. Yeah. But we need to see the PowerPoint bit. Yeah. So if I kick that off. At least our viewers will know what that was about when they saw lots of video pictures, because that's good old-fashioned feedback, not audio feedback <laughs> that we're used to seeing. That was video yeah. feedback, really. Right. I think we're getting that's there now. Doing it again. Yeah, we need to lose your picture, really, Mike. So I think... Um, yeah. Yeah. 
Council. Um, let's drop that down. Ah, How's now we've looking? got it. Perfect. We're there. We can Excellent. see the screen. We... Yep. Good. Right. <laughs> okay, well, welcome, everyone. Um, the plan for tonight is to go through uh, this menu, if you like, of things. So I'll introduce you to the Pi models because there's been a lot of changes to the Pi models over the year. They've improved considerably and the changes in the last year have been really quite significant. So I thought it might be helpful just to go through the models and see how they all relate. Uh, and then we'll look at the operating system, which has just changed again. And then the rest of the presentation will be all about Pi applications and what you can do with them with a, a, a radio uh, bias on everything that we're doing. So the Pi started off life as a, a computer science learning platform because the guys at Cambridge realised that they weren't getting the student numbers they needed. And when they looked at it, they realised that the kids of today don't have computers that they can play with to program with. They have lots of computers they can play games on, but not computers that they can program and learn on and make mistakes and make a mess of and it not being a problem. So that's why they developed the Raspberry Pi. But what they didn't appreciate was um, the strong maker community interest. And by the maker community, I mean people like us, but also all the electronics and um, hobbyists out there that can make use of a small, cheap computer. <clears throat> so it's turned into an overwhelming success for them. They're now a big business. They've sold more than 30 million uh, Raspberry Pis since it was launched in 2012. And um, they're all made now at the Sony UK Technology Centre in Bridgend. So they're all British made. And they're currently producing 10,000 units a day across all models, which is a phenomenal number. So let's look at how the series of models um, started. So it all began with the Pi Model B, which then became the B+. Plus, um, and then with the B+, Plus, it changed its format to have more USB ports and better mounting holes, spacing, and all that sort of thing. The um, Pi Model 2 was a significant step up in um, number of processor cores. And then th the Model 3B was the one that really made a difference for radio use, because with the Model 3B, we could run all the data modes programs without any problem. That further improved with the Model 3B+. Plus. And one model that a lot of people forget about, which is still good value, is the th Model 3A+. Plus. Basically, it's a 3B+, plus, but without the uh, Ethernet port. It's still got Wi-Fi, um, and it's only got one USB port, I think. But if you can get away with that, it's a much cheaper way of getting all that power. And then last year, we moved on to the Pi Model 4, <clears throat> with models having one, two, and four gigabytes of RAM with them. And that's since moved on so that the same model now has two, four, and eight gigabytes as the standard amount of RAM. So it's really quite a big and powerful beast now. Now, always running alongside the main model was a light model, for want of a better word. Originally, it was thought that the Pi Model A would be the one that the schools would use. So it was a cut-down version uh, that the kids could use. But it's found all sorts of other uses. We had the A and the A+, and the A+, was really just a change of format and board size to make it more compact. But the big change was the move to the Pi Zero, because when that came out, it was really, really cheap. I think it was £4 when it first arrived, which is amazing, because it's actually got more power than the Pi Model B, the first version thereof. So that was followed quickly by the Pi Zero W, and the big addition there was that it had Wi-Fi and Bluetooth built in, which made it so much more useful. And there's now versions, the H version has just got the headers, the GPIO headers soldered in. So what's good about the Pi 4? Well, it's got a brand new quad-core 64-bit processor that runs at one and a half gigs. And if you look at uh, cheap laptops, that, that would give them a run for their money. 
you get 248 gigabit RAM. It's got a dedicated dual port graphics processor. It supports one monitor at 4K 60 frames a second, or it can do two monitors at 4K at 30 frames per second. And obviously, easily, it can do HD monitors, a pair of HD monitors. So you can have really big screen displays connected to the Pi, and it'll handle it quite comfortably. The, uh, the trick with the Pi that makes it so flexible is that whereas most other computers have a hard drive, um, either a rotating hard drive or a solid state hard drive that contains the operating system. With the Raspberry Pi, it's all contained on a little micro SD card. That means it's cheap, it's really easy to change, and that's the secret of its use as a learning tool. Because if you get in a muddle, you just burn another SD card and plug it in and start again. Uh, and that's a really powerful feature of the Pi. Although some will say it slows it down a bit, it's actually... Um, I think it's quite a positive feature. <clears throat> now, um, soon to arrive, and that's like within the next month or so, should be the ability to boot from the network, or what is perhaps more interesting for a lot of people, is to boot from a USB-connected drive. And that means you could have one of these very cheap external uh, solid-state drives, which you can pick up for about 20 or £30 pounds now, and that will speed the loading of programs, etc. And it will automatically boot from that. It's got dedicated serial camera and display ports, which means it can link directly with the Raspberry Pi 7-inch display and also use the, the neat Pi cameras. But the, the real thing that made the Pi 4 difference from all the other ones is um, the ins and outs, basically. Because the, um, the previous Pi's had used effectively an onboard USB port to provide the gig, the Ethernet and the USB port. So that was a natural bottleneck, which limited the Pi on a lot of things that we wanted to do. But the Pi 4 has now got full-speed gigabit Ethernet. It's also got full-speed USB 2 and full-speed USB 3 um, sockets as well. So that's two USB uh, 2 and two USB 3. It's got onboard Wi-Fi, including the faster 5 gigs and um, Bluetooth 5. And it's ready to do uh, power over Ethernet, which is another flexible, uh, flexible arrangement. So you can run the Pi out somewhere remote and just use a standard um, Cat5 network cable to, to, to both power it and to um, make a network connection. And the thermal management has been improved. Uh, you, you'll see that the processor on there has got a metal case that's to help the thermal management. And for those who've tried to use the hardware serial ports on the Pi, in the previous Pis, we only had one hardware serial port and one software emulated serial port. And the Bluetooth wanted the hardware port. So when we wanted to do... Um, a GPS board or anything like that, we're having to swap ports around. With the new Pi, we've got four extra hardware ports, which is a real big plus. So this is what it looks like. Um, the changes from previous models, it looks initially very similar, but the changes are that the, the Ethernet jack is moved to the other side of the board, and there are now two uh, micro HDMI ports to supply two monitors want to use that so one of the problems with getting more power and this has happened with all the small computing boards as they've increased the power you get more heat it's inevitable um, and so as i mentioned we had the metal case for the graphics chip and the processor they've also changed the way some of the software is running and the firmware is operating to improve the efficiency and reduce temperature uh, and you can run a Pi 4 on its own, uncased, uh, with no problems at all. You won't uh, generally have heat problems. But if you put it in an enclosure, the temperature does rise very quickly, especially if you're working it hard. Uh, and the processor throttles back at 85 degrees. And, and that's not really a healthy operating temperature anyway. It's going to shorten its life. So I've seen people put small stick-on heat sinks and they're of limited value unless you make some air movement across them. So uh, that's not the recommended way 
that I would go, but I've got a number of suggestions that uh, you can have a look at. Um, this is one. This is a rather neat uh, aluminium case, and it's um, die-cast aluminium with a hefty heat sink on the top. And as you can see, there are thermal pads to couple it to the three hottest um, chips on the board. Uh, and that does a really good job of keeping the pie cool, uh, but it also provides some protection. So I'll use that on my test pie that I've got here that I'm always faffing about with basically putting things on it and connecting things to it, etc., running different software. And that's really useful for that. Um, and it costs about £12, which I think is a very reasonable price for what it is. It's a, it's a solid hunk of die-cast aluminium, nicely machined up to fit very well on the pie. The other one, that I, which is, this is probably the first solution that I used when the pie came out, is this neat, neat little fan shim. Uh, and the reason it's called a shim is because it's so thin. It's just an interference fit over the uh, GPIO pins. You literally just push it on and it sits very low so there's still room for uh, other things to connect to the GPIO pins. Um, it only costs £9.90 from Pi Moroni and because the fan sat right on top of the processor it blows a good uh, blast of air across everything and it, it's very quiet, very quiet indeed. And you can still get add-on boards on top if you need to use the GPIO pins. Uh, it just takes power from that, which is really good. Oh, and there's a little Python app. If you don't want the fan running all the time, you can have a Python app running in the background that looks at the processor temperature and only turns it on when it needs to. So if you're going to end up with a boxed Pi project when you've finished whatever it is you're going to do with it, then the Argon one is a really good... Um, well, David tipped me off to this one, actually, but I'm very impressed with it. It's the result of a Kickstarter project, um, so it's crowdfunded. And here you've got a die-cast metal case, and in the top of the case is a fan, um, thermal conducting lugs with pads to link up to um, the hottest uh, chips in there. And you'll notice that it also moves the uh, GPIO ports round to the uh, one side. And over here on the right-hand side, you'll see that there's an add-on board that plugs into the HDMI jacks and the audio and video jack. Now, the whole idea of this board is not only to um, make a compact enclosure for the Pi, but it also brings all the connections to the rear surface. So as you'll see now, this is what it looks like complete. So you get a new power button, so you can turn it on and off just like you would an ordinary computer with a long press to uh, force it to stop, a short press to start it, etc. <clears throat> um, and the flap at the top there is a little magnetic flap that you can pull off, and underneath there is all the GPIO ports that are all labelled. So if you want to use it to connect to something else, you can. So I just think that's a really good... Um, really good case for the Pi 4. And because it's um, such a solid case and it's got the fan in it, it's got plenty of ventilation slots, it regulates the temperature very well indeed. And uh, I reckon £25 is a good price for that. So let's just look at the Pi Zero because it's worth a look. Um, it's still only £4.60, including VAT, for the basic one. A 1 gigs processor with 512 meg of RAM, the Pi camera connector, and the Pi Zero W, which is the one that's illustrated there, is £9.30, including VAT. And that's got the Wi-Fi plus Bluetooth. And it's available with, with or without the GPIO connector. So if we look at it in detail, um, you can see there's the, on the left-hand side is the micro SD card slot. And coming around the bottom is the mini HDMI port for the video. You can see there's a little uh, slot antenna there, which is the Wi-Fi antenna, a single USB port, micro USB for power, and the serial camera input. 
so now let's look at the Raspberry Pi operating system. It's just changed its name. Up until uh, last month, I think it was, it was called uh, Raspbian. Uh, but it's now changed to the Raspberry Pi operating system. At the moment, it's essentially the same. Um, but it's derived from Debian Linux, which is one of the best-known Linux distributions around. And currently, it's a 32-bit operating system, even though the Pi has a 64-bit processor. But there is a new 64-bit operating system that's in beta testing at the moment that you can go to the Pi uh, site and download if you want. Uh, the standard distribution includes a range of very useful programs, uh, but there's a huge range of free software available via the recommended software app on the Pi. Um, it has all you need for a home computer, basically. So uh, let's take a look. This is going to be fun. So if I bring that down there, I'm going to jump out to show you a Raspberry Pi. There we go. That should be taken up the screen. Yes, it is. So this is the desktop, standard desktop for a Raspberry Pi. And... It's much like any other desktop, to be honest. Uh, let me just move this down so it's out of the way. So up here in the top left is the um, Pi button, which is like the start button. You click on that, and I can't spell radio. I can see it at the top there. <laughs> uh, and you see um, all the, those are all the programming um, um, interfaces that are available to program in all manner of different languages. Um, on the office front, so if you want to do um, edit documents, write a document or whatever, LibreOffice is almost a copycat of my Microsoft Word in what it does. So if you go to Lib LibreOffice Writer, so this is the word processor, which will start up. You'll see it looks very familiar to most word processors. If I open a recent document, I loaded one of my instruction sheets on here. There we go. It even tracks, <laughs> even tracks all the changes where I've been editing this document. So I can turn that off, turn off track changes. And you see, so it's got all the formatting of the, of the original document. And I can save this and send it back to Microsoft Word and uh, it will edit it okay. So it's um, it's a really useful program, and as well as the um, uh, uh, Microsoft Office, the, the sorry, the Word equivalent, you, you've got the calculator, a uh, calc for uh, Excel, um, and Impress for PowerPoint, etc. Really well sorted. You've also got a Chrome browser for the internet, so. Um, uh, that that works pretty well, so you can just pull that up. You get the standard Google for RSGB. And away we go. We're in, so you can see it browses quite quickly, um, and um, and really works quite well. So you can use this as just a general office computer. Really, I think it's brilliant. Um, so it's very powerful. So let's jump out of that one. And we go back to the slideshow. So that's a quick look around the operating system. So the next point is what do you need to get started? <clears throat> so you bought your Pi. What other things you're going to need? So you're going to need a keyboard and a mouse. And it will work with pretty much any USB keyboard and mouse combination. I quite like the the Perix uh, model I've put up there. Um, I've been using that for ages. I drop it, I throw it around, and it seems to survive. Um, and there's another one there, the jelly comb one, that seems to work very well as well. But you really can use pretty much any keyboard. You can use Bluetooth keyboards as well. Um, so it's very flexible. On the network side, obviously the Ethernet is the fastest and most reliable, and there's no setup. If you plug an Ethernet cable into a Pi, it automatically uses that as its default uh, network. You don't have to set anything up. Um, the Wi-Fi is good, and there's a simple uh, wizard to uh, get you on your Wi-Fi network on the uh, desktop, which is very easy to do. 
For the display, you can use the standard uh, HDMI display um, or 4K and dual monitors. It's very flexible. What I wouldn't do is use the composite video output. It has got an old-fashioned composite video, but that's lousy quality compared to what you can get from the HDMI port. Uh, to power it, you need 5 volts DC at around 2 to 3 amps, depending on which model you're using and how many peripherals you're connecting, etc. Um, now, that can be supplied in a number of ways. You can get um, a plug-top power unit. Uh, you can use mobile phone power packs, the ones you use to recharge your phones. You can do a boost converter with a LiPo pack. Or you can do power over the Ethernet. Um, now, one of the things that I ought to point out here is if you're supplying your own USB lead between your power source and the Raspberry Pi, so that would be a USB cable to a micro USB. If you're supplying that yourself, do not buy any of these super flexible soft cables because they use hopelessly thin uh, wire and the volt drop is often too much and you'll get unreliable performance from your Pi. So always use a lead that's rated for high-speed charging because that has to handle about two amps, I think, for high-speed charging. So make sure you get a good quality lead. It's very important. Otherwise, you'll get really random failures on your Pi. So the other way to operate a Pi is not to have any of that paraphernalia of keyboards and displays, but to actually connect to it remotely. Uh, and that's what I'm doing here for these demonstrations. So um, Real VNC is the app I suggest you do use because it's included in the operating system. It provides full remote access to the desktop of the Pi. And you get a free online account for internet access. And you can have up to five computers on this. And if you activate this, you can actually get onto your Pi from anywhere in the world where there's internet and it's free. So it's well worth um, doing that. The alternative way to, to connect to um, your Pi, if you only need command line access, then you can use SSH. Um, it's very simple to enable and it's, it's useful if you're doing command line stuff. And you can um, enable both of those via the preferences mes menu and the Raspberry Pi configuration tool. So here's a little demo of what real VNC is like. So I'm off again. While you do this, Mike, if so, it's okay, I'm just going to come in and remind everybody watching, particularly if you're watching on the YouTube channel, that um, if you want to ask questions of Mike, you can ask them during the talk or later. But you do need to go to the BATC channel to be able to actually ask questions and sign in there. So if you're watching on YouTube but you'd like to ask some questions, head over to the BATC channel. You might be able to even watch on both of those uh, streams. But we've got roughly twice as many people watching on uh, YouTube as the uh, BATC at the moment. So if you want to ask questions, though, please ask there. Back to you, Mike. Thank you. OK, so this is what uh, the VNC app looks like when you open it. Up here are all the um, connections that I've previously used. And it's just so easy to use, as I used it just before. So you just click on the one you want, and away it goes. Now, it does that so easily because I've asked it, I've told it, the IP address of the Pi that I want to connect to, and I've let it save the password, so it goes straight in. But you can um, create a new one. So if I do a new connection, this box will come up, and all you need to do is um, put in the uh, IP address of the Pi you want to get to, give it a friendly name, and <clears throat> then you can um, make it active and and it'll ask for you for the password. And the first time it asks you for the password, there's a little box you can tick, which lets you um, remember the password. So you can go straight in. So that's the uh, VNC viewer, which is a really useful app. Let's just get the slideshow going again, which I think we have. Good. <clears throat> now, one of the useful radio applications for um, the Raspberry Pi, probably one of the first ones that people started to look at it seriously for, was as a data modes workstation. 
So instead of having data mode programs all over your main computer, to have a separate computer that did all the data mode side of things. Uh, and that's particularly attractive to people that travel, perhaps like to go away in a caravan, holidays, etc. So you don't have to take your main computer. You could actually just take your Raspberry Pi and your rig and you could operate all your data modes with, without having to have a computer taking up space in the caravan. So all you really need to add in most cases is a USB sound card, uh, and they're really cheap. Um, you don't need to get anything sophisticated. A 10 to 20 pound uh, USB sound card will be fine. I'll show you an example in a moment. However, if you've got one of the newer rigs that has got a USB connection for the CAT control and for the audio, then you don't need to buy anything else. Just connect those leads through into the Pi. I think most modern rigs are now are coming out with a USB socket on the back. You connect that to your computer and you can get access to the CAT control and the audio without adding any extra sound cards or anything else. That's really good. Now, the I've put a list here of all the, all the software that I know works well with the Pi and I've been using for years now. So obviously everyone wants WSJTX um, and you can install it and upgrade from the WSJTX site. <clears throat> There's very good instructions on the site, um, so it's dead easy to do. FL Digi is very good for all the other data modes, uh, but if you want the latest version, you have to build it from source. It is available on the local Pi repository, but it's well out of date. So if you want an up-to-date version, you need to build it from source. But there's a simple answer in that a wonderful guy who lives at IndieHam.com has written an installation script. And all you have to do is follow the instructions, download and install that script. And when you run it, it will automatically build effort, the latest FL Digi uh, and install it on your Pi, which is great. Uh, if you'd like to do some different stuff like SSTV, <clears throat> then QSSTV is very um, good program. It handles all the HF SSTV modes. You can install it from the author's site, and it's quite straightforward to do. JTDX is an alternative uh, weak signals mode, and the installation process is just the same as WSJTX. Now, if you want packet radio, then Direwolf is by far the best packet radio support because you don't need a TNC. It does it all in software uh, with an audio card. Uh, but you need to build the latest version from source to use it successfully on the Pi. Uh, but there's good instructions on the author's site. And if you want to do logging, the best one I found is CQR log. Um, you can get version 2.3 from the Pi repository. Um, and you can upgrade to 2.4, which is the latest one, using a script you can download from my site um, below. I also, um, I sell micro SD cards, which are preloaded with all these data modes uh, programs, so they're all ready to run for those that don't actually want to get involved in installing software and configuring stuff. So that's all available from there. I'll have some links at the end of this presentation, so don't uh, panic on that. So I was just going to show you, I can't do you a full live show of data modes because with all the demos that I set up here, I've actually <laughs> run out of aerials. So You look like you nearly so, run out of desktop as well, actually. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's a bit chaos. <laughs> a bit chaos. Mine's, mine's worse. <laughs> Yeah, um, where did I put it? I hid it in there. No, it's in here. Right, there we go. <clears throat> so this is the one where I spelt radio programs wrong. So this is what my card looks like if you have the data modes card. So all the programs are in here together, so they're dead quick and easy to do. Just click on it. And, um, and Mike, does your <clears throat> card also include the operating system as well then? Yeah. So literally, if yeah. you've got that card, you, you can just it plug in it in and it works. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. It's, been, it's proved very popular because I know a lot of people don't want to get involved with building stuff from source and all that sort of thing. What they really want to do is use the ply to do something. 
and they don't necessarily at this moment want to learn how to build software from source. So that's why I produce them, and they've been very popular. Um, so here we go. We've got the standard WSJTX screen. Um, everything works as normal. Decodes are fast, and um, it's um, it's just really good. It's, um, I'm, I'm sorry I can't show you it working because I literally – I've got several several things going at the same time here. And just before I went on air, I realised I couldn't actually get any audio to <laughs> to WSJTX. So that's a quick look at um, what the data modes card looks like. So let's go now to the, the next thing area that's interesting is to use um, the Raspberry Pi for SDR application software defined radio. Now, these uh, obviously use a lot of processing power just by their very nature because it moves a lot of the effort from analog devices through to being handled inside a computer. So the one that most of you are probably familiar with is that all the Pi models work very well as an RTL-SDR dongle server. This enables you to access your RTL-SDR receiver from anywhere on your local network. So you can you can put your dongle in your shack, connect it up to your antenna, run the server, and you can sit out in the garden and listen to it, or you can sit in the lounge and listen to it on your laptop, etc. So um, it works really well, and uh, that's been running for quite a long time now. It's a good way to use a Pi that you don't know what to do with. Um, Mike, just can I so, just ask if you don't mind, for the sake of um, some of those watching, may not have heard of an RTL SDR dongle. Uh, are you oh, now yeah. going to show it to us? Yep. Brilliant. Thank you. <laughs> so so this is this is what it looks like. Um they're basically produced as a um a TV dongle to go in your computer so you can watch digital TV. So you put a TV antenna in the back, you plug it into your uh, computer and you can watch um digital TV and you can also listen to DAB radio. So because that's quite a big market, they're really cheap. Um sort of five to 15 pounds for one of these. But I can't remember the name of the guys, but a few years back, someone discovered that you can actually extract the uh, IQ signals from the point at where the signal's digitized inside this little chip. And the fact that you could extract those I and Q signals meant you could then use it as a software-defined receiver. So that created a whole industry around RTL dongles. And basically they work from um, somewhere around about 50 megs up to about 2000 megs, uh, often with continuous coverage. And there's some mods you can do to get a sort of HF coverage, or you can put a HF converter on the front, etc. cetera. So um, now they're really good, um, really useful. So as a dongle server, you would just connect the Pi and the um, dongle like so to an antenna. And then you use just cheap Ethernet cable to cable it back to your shack or whatever, because you could mount this up on a mast if you wanted. Um, and then you connect it to a power supply and a computer. And you can send power over the Ethernet cable and you can send the IQ data back to the computer. Once it's on your network, as I said, you can listen to it from any computer, which is quite good. Now, a slightly upmarket version of that is Spy Server that was developed by the AirSpy team. It supports all the AirSpy receivers plus RTL SDR dongles. And it enables internet sharing, which you can't do with the RTL dongle. The RTL SDR dongle server demands too much bandwidth to successfully send it over the internet whereas this one doesn't, and I'll show you how in a moment. It also allows multiple people to connect to the same uh, receiver. So this is how things uh, look. So a standard air spy um, <clears throat> would need around 80 megabits of data to be able to use the full IQ, even at 2.5 megabits sampling. But with spy server, this is what happens. The signal from the air spy goes to a Raspberry Pi where it's downsampled. So instead of having a two megabits uh, bandwidth of signal go uh, through the Ethernet, 
you bring it down to about 15 or 20 kilohertz and you put it into a data combiner. But the other thing we need is the, the fast Fourier, uh, Fourier transform spectrum display because we all love the spectrum display. So what they do, they build that separately and send it down as video frames. Combine it in the data combiner and you get the best of both worlds. So it looks the same as the direct feed. So you can see the full two and a half megabits or uh, megahertz or eight megahertz in the, in the case of the full air spy. But you only use a fraction of the bandwidth. So it's a really good thing, the spy server. Now, another great project for uh, a Pi, and any Pi model will do this, is to set up your own receive-only APRS iGate node. Now, if you're not familiar with an iGate node, um, it's an interface between the airwaves and the internet. So with APRS, if you want APRS to be successful and more useful, what you want is lots of ways to pick up information from people who are traveling and get it into the network. And one simple way to do that is to put a receive-only node up, which picks up the traffic from anyone driving past and puts it in the internet so it can be shared with anyone. So it's a great little project. It's a good starter project if you want something simple to do. So all you need for an ideal setup is a Pi 0 W and an RTL STR dongle. Now it uses two bits of software. It uses software called RTL FM and Direwolf, the packet radio software. So let's have a look at a block diagram because that will make it easier to understand. So you start with the RTL dongle then the antenna. That connects to the Raspberry Pi, it just plugs into a USB port. Inside the Pi, you have the RTL FM software, which drives the dongle, takes the IQ data, and turns it into audio, and then passes it to Dire Wolf, which is the packet radio software. But the trick is, <clears throat> we pass the information digitally between the two. So we don't need to add a sound card or two sound cards to make that connection. So it's done digitally. And then the, um, we use a uh, Wi-Fi connection to link to the inter through your home internet uh, to link to the iGate servers. It's really good. And you need to add a power supply, of course. Mike, can Excuse I just me? ask a question here, which did come up, which I think might be relevant. It was when you were talking yes. about the RTL dongle the first time, and Jimmy asks, what are I and Q signals? All right, okay. Um, <clears throat> when you, um, in order to demodulate um, signals using SDR, what you need is an in-phase signal and a quadrature signal. Now, a quadrature signal is just 90 degrees out of phase with the in-phase signal. Now, what that effectively enables you to do is to tell which direction, which direction the signal is moving. And IQ sig signals are the absolute fundamental of all software-defined receivers. Because if you've got the I and the Q signal, you can demodulate any signal that's coming in. So um, just an impromptu introduction yeah, to Yeah, lovely. And, and someone actually on uh, the BATC site has just put up a link from a Wikipedia thing about uh, phase and quadrature components as well to help you. So thanks for that, Mike. Oh, jolly good. <clears throat> now, the other area we can go with uh, the Raspberry Pi, which is quite successful, is to link it to uh, high-performance SDR-based hardware projects. Now, High Performance SDR is a project that's been running for, for some time now, <clears throat> and uh, it's a team of probably the top people in the business in terms of uh, SDR from an amateur radio point of view, and often commercially as well. But they're the, they're the top people in the business who've been trying to develop uh, High Performance SDR hardware and software. And there have been lots of outcomes from this. The one that most people are probably most familiar with is the Apache Labs range of transceivers, the NN transceivers, uh, top end transceivers. They are all based on output from the HPSDR uh, projects. Um, now, all the hardware is Ethernet connected, which is quite handy. 
Apache Labs transceivers are the obvious ones to uh, think of when you talk of HPSDR. But there's also the Hermes Light 2, which is a great little board I'll tell you about in a minute. There's also the Radio Berry 2, which is an even more interesting board. So let's have a look at those. Hermes Light 2 came out of the, uh, of the HPSDR project. And what they wanted to do was to produce a cheaper version, but basing it on a 12-bit cable modem chip. So all the Apache Lab stuff is based around 16-bit sampling, um, and that gets expensive. Um, but if you come down to using this 12-bit cable modem chip, it reduces the price considerably. And the performance, if you've ever seen one, is quite amazing because these are clever guys and they've done a hell of a lot to optimize it. So what it makes is a single board transceiver, five watts output. So if you like operating QRP as I do, that's all you need. Um, and it covers LF to 30 megs in one go. You can partner it with the N2 ADR filter board which is a very nice switched um, low-pass filter board that partners with it and is automatically operated by the um, HPSDR software. So it makes a really nice setup. And the total cost for that is um, about £300. So let's, um, and you can buy them currently from MakerFabs uh, in China. But MakerFabs are really good. Um, I've used them for a lot of stuff. Uh, and they've uh, this project has been used in uh, Maker Fabs, and they've got some rigorous quality control. There's very few rejects, so they're very good indeed. So here is a Pi uh, Hermes Light board. The board on the left, the larger board, that's the Hermes Light 2. And the board on the right is the switched filter board. And this little header in between the two is the link. And this all fits in a very neat little Euro card case. Um, and it's a brilliant little setup. Um, now, the other one, which is really interesting, and I have promised to do an article for Radcom on this one, is the Radio Berry 2. So it's based on the Hermes Light 2, but it uses a Raspberry Pi to provide all the processing and the network connectivity. So it shares the work, if you like. It mounts on top of a Pi on the GPIO pins. And um, you can use it with an external PA. I mean, I've got a 10-watt PA from QRP kits, uh, but there's other ways uh, you could link it. It's homebrew only. Um, I got some boards last time. I, I got some boards and sold them out as a group buy. Um, it is homebrew only. Um, it's challenging but possible. I did it with my 71-year-old eyes and no special equipment. Um, I didn't have a microscope, all I had a hot air gun and small soldering irons. That's what it looks like. <clears throat> As you can see, it's really neat. It sits on top of the Raspberry Pi and you've got two SMA sockets here, one for the receive, one for the transmit. But it's an excellent little board. And it's been included in the Hermes Light um, GitHub site for all the software and everything. And they're developing the software all the time. But it's great little uh, radio. So let's look at the software you can use. So we've got um, the main ones that get used for this, PyHPSTR, which is developed by John Melton. And it's optimized for use with the Pi 7-inch touchscreen. It runs on a 3 or 4. And it has support for manual control. So if you like to have a manual tuning knob, you can fit all those things to it. It works a treat. Uh, you will, um, I think they sell it commercially still, the Pi HP SDR, um, but you can build it yourself with this. Now, the other one, which, which I like, which is also from John, uh, it's based on the Pi HP SDR, but is redesigned for desktop use. It supports large displays and it runs on a Pi 4. So let's have a quick look at it. So let's go to my there. So here we have, <clears throat> this is a Pi 4 running uh, Lin HPSDR on my Hermes Light uh, board. Okay. I can't give you audio, I'm afraid. I'm sorry about that. But um, 
it all got too complicated trying to feed audio through to this. I just wanted to demonstrate it working. So as you can see up here, um, we've only got 34% or 30% proceb processor being used. Now, if we wanted to get interesting, we could add a second receiver. So there we go. We have a second receiver running now, which can be tuned anywhere between um, LF and 30 megs. So just to prove it, we'll go down to, um, I don't know, 40 meters and see what's going on there. So we've, we've now got two completely independent receivers running. We can choose to transmit on either one of those. You'll see the top one's got a signed transmit at the moment, but you can change that around. Um, and if you really want to get going, that's not the processor up to a nearer 50%. But you can also have a wideband receiver running, and this is looking at the whole spectrum from uh, zero. It's looking through to 60 megs, but you've got to remember that the Hermes light cuts off at 30. So uh, the stuff above 30 is nonsense. So, And we're still running at about 50%, so it's, um, it's quite comfortable doing that. So... Uh, and what it can also do, and I can't show you today, unfortunately, although I can just run it up. I haven't got the links in in between the data modes program and this software. But I'll just show you that WSJTX will run at the same time. This is where it all goes pear shaped crashes. Please don't do that, Mike, because <laughs> we're talking to you and watching you on the same computer. So. Your computer's having to earn its living tonight. It is, yeah. It's doing a lot. Yeah, because that's the other thing to bear in mind, that um, as well as running all these programs, the Pi is also handling the um, real VNC uh, server to uh, send this sp screen across. So here we go. So that's WSJTX and um, two receivers and a full spectrum running, and it's still going. So just really to demonstrate to you that the Pi 4 is very comfortable with this sort of thing. And uh, most of the time you'd probably run it either with run receiver or a couple of receivers going um, and a data modes program. Um, but as you can see, it's, um, it's great setup. It works really well. <clears throat> so let's go back to my presentation. Uh, I think we're getting near the end now. It will be relieved. <laughs> well, it would be a good opportunity to remind people again, if you're watching, uh, especially if you're watching on YouTube and you'd like to ask Mike some questions, this would be a good time to start entering them now. But you do need to go to the BATC website to ask questions, and then I'll uh, be uh, reading those to Mike at the end. Okay. So if you want to play with software-defined radio uh, receivers, etc., and you don't want to... Um, have to build loads of software from scratch, etc. Um, there's a young guy put together an image called Pi SDR, um, and it's a Raspberry image with SDR software on it, and it includes SDR Angel, Soapy Remote, which is a great name, <laughs> GQRX, which is probably one of the most popular um, SDR receivers, GNU Radio, and some uh, line programs as well. You can download it from there, but don't panic. It's on my last page as well, so you can get that. Uh, I think we probably ought to put together a links page or a links message at the end of this so that everyone can see all the links to stuff that I've used. Yes, Mike. Actually, we've already been asked by Jimmy again. He actually asks, will there be links for all these things? So I'm sure that what yeah. we can do as well with the RSGB is we can put a page up as well as the links within you at this video. I'm sure we can put up a page of the, the uh, most popular links that people will need. Yeah, that'll be fine. Yeah, good stuff. So let's now go back to my <clears throat> VNC viewer. Now, this time I'm going into the Pi SDR image. Okay, so this is what it looks like. Um, <clears throat> nice, clean interface. It's basically the Raspberry Pi operating system. So at the top, you've got the Pi menu, and you know, you've got a range of programs already in here and you can add more 
So, but if we look at this, probably the most popular receiver to use, the most well-known is GQRX. So if I run that, we'll execute that. So there's GQRX. Now this is connected to an ASPI HF Plus discovery. And there we go, it's on the VHF M band at the moment. <clears throat> um, and there you go. There's a little bit of jerkiness you'll see there. That's because of the real VNC client. It's not jerky on the actual Pi itself. But the audio coming from it is dead smooth and uh, and that. So if you want to just play with some SDR receivers with the Pi, this is a good image to get because it's already configured for you. Once you've burnt the um, SD card, you literally plug it in, start the Pi, and it will come up like this. And if you want to get clever with um, um, SDR, it's got the GNU Radio Companion already loaded. If I can double click, right. <clears throat> now this this is a great tool if you want to um, play with SDR radio and how things work because this is a flow flow diagram um, method of building a radio. Um, whoops, I can't spell sync. Well, I won't go through and do it now. Um, if you look up, um, if you do YouTube GNU Radio, you'll find lots of tutorials in there, um, and you can uh, you can go through and create simple receivers yourself. And it's a great way to learn how SDR receivers work and what all the various bits do. And you can also use it to build a specialist receiver just for your own purpose, and transmitters for that matter. To think of it, so. Let's get this back up to full screen. <clears throat> so here we are now on the summary. You can uh, breathe a sigh of relief. So you can see there's plenty of radio applications for the Raspberry Pi. The Pi 4 has transformed the Pi in terms of capabilities. I've only scratched the surface in terms of the things you can do. Um, you, you can have all sorts of uh, hotspots for digital radio. Um, loads of different things you can do with the Pi that I haven't touched on here. Uh, and if you want to have a go at programming, it is a great tool to learn programming. Because, as I said earlier, if it all goes wrong, just take the SD card out, put another one in, and away you go. So you can make mistakes without messing anything up. Uh, it's a really safe environment. And the development tools that are included on the Pi are really, really good. So if you want to learn Python, for example, there's a program called Thony, T-H-O-N-M-Y, which is a dedicated Python um, IDE. And it's really simple. And you can write your program and test it all within the same application. And um, it's a really good way to go. So here's a few links to start off with. Whoops. So that's for, now, it, those who've bought my book, and thank you to all those who bought my book. I think it's been selling quite well. Um, and if anyone's interested in my book, go to the RSGB bookshop, and it will be there for you. Now, in order to handle any um, typos, of which there's been a few, if you want to report a typo to me, or you want to check anything for accuracy, if you go to the Groups IO user group I've listed up there, I've set a dedicated group up off a Raspberry Pi Explained, and that contains all the errors, and there are not too many at the moment. Uh, plus, there's also lots of discussion about people trying to do things. Uh, I'm regularly on there trying to give people help. So if you need support on the Pi, by all means, join the group, um, and that will be good. Um, the middle, middle link is to that SDR starter image, and that's a free download. And if you want to look at some of the cards that I've got, my, the cards are up for sale. They're all the same price. They're £9.50. And for that, you get a 16 gig class 10 SD card, all fully loaded with the software. You also get somewhere around about eight printed pages of instructions and guidance if you get stuck. Plus, I give direct support 
if you uh, if you can't get things going. So I think um, David, that's about it. That's good. Okay, Mike. Um, just to follow Shall up on I your take card. That down? Pardon. Sorry. Should I take that down? or You, you can take that? that down, I think, now. That's great. Because well, what we're going to do, we'll arrange with the society to, to get those links put up onto probably on the page, on the webinars page that we've set up for this series. Um, I've just got yep. one question, actually, follow up on that. You said they were £9.50. That presumably includes UK post? It does, yeah. Okay. Because there might be people watching from abroad and they may want them. So I guess they contact you and, and then uh, they can if, find if you, Yeah, if you, if you buy via my website, I've got a web store set up. And it's a flat three pounds postage to anywhere in the in the world, or free for UK. Okay, that's lovely. All right, well we'll see me in the studio now just for a moment, and uh, yep. while Mike maybe adjusts his screen so we can actually see him in vision because we've heard him, but we haven't seen much of him as well. And as I mentioned yeah. earlier, if you are have been watching this and you'd like to ask some questions, this is the right time to do it because we'll be ending fairly shortly now. I've got a few questions that you have asked during the talk um which uh, we're going to put those to mike any moment now i think mike's just getting his uh, his um picture better right we've got that now so mike um, one of the here. questions yeah, yeah. Well, one of the questions that came in was um booting from a network this was from by the way from michael ea7kir he asks booting from a network what kind of server do you need do you know i don't know <laughs> I don't know, does he mean maybe a power of server, maybe the type of power? Because you said you can also boot from a USB drive, didn't you? Yeah, the, the idea of the network boot, it's particularly attractive for schools. So you can have a common image that all the, that all the users in the classroom use. So you know when they start up, they all boot up to a common image. So you've got the same start point. Otherwise, in a school environment, you've got, you know, a dozen SD cards in different uh, machines. And by the time the kids are tinkered with them, they're going to be a bit of a mess probably. So by booting from the network, you can get everyone to start with a, a clean system. Um, and you don't have to have the SD cards in to make it run. Okay. That, that's its main, that's its main use. Lovely. Okay. Boot, booting from a USB drive is particularly useful for those people that would rather have their software on uh, an SSD, for example, on an external drive, rather than rely on SD cards. Okay. So, and that's coming with the doing... next edition of the operating system. You said it due any minute. It's it's going to be in any minute. Yeah, yeah. It's um, you you can um, you can get it in beta trial at the moment. Uh, so that means it's very close if it's in beta. Okay. Another question that came in from G8NWC, are older versions of Pi okay with the later software? Uh, yes. The, well, the later um, operating system, yeah. Yeah, yeah. It's, they're always backwards compatible. What, what you won't be able to do on one of the older Pis is run things like the SDR software and the data mode software because they won't have the power for that. Okay. Uh, another question for you. Um, I find if I sorry, I've just lost a little bit of it there, but I find a, a Pi connected to the via the Ethernet port generates a lot of RFI on two meters. Um, and this is from Nev M zero NFY. He says he's got a Pi three that does that, a Model B plus, and a Model two B and a Pi three B. Is it just him? He says. <laughs> no, I've I've heard other people. Um, experience problems with it um, probably the thing to do is to make sure that your all your external connections to the pi um, are choked basically you've got ferrites and things on to try and minimize stuff that escapes and you can put the pi in a metal box make sure it's a screen metal box in fact that um, that argon case that i mentioned um that's got a good earth connection to it. So that'll make quite a good screen box as well if you're using a Pi 4. Great. I believe actually we do, looking for some of the comments on the BATC, we may have a bit of a problem with the stream to them. We're dead on nine o'clock. So we'll find out what that is for next time for sure. Uh, meantime, if you have got that problem and you want to ask a question, we can still see questions live on BATC. So you can still got just a moment or two to ask a question on there. Um, or of course you can watch as well on the YouTube channel and someone's put the link up for that as well. 
Um, I've got a few other questions for you, Mike, just in case we've got anybody else who wants to yeah, come sure. in on, on questions on that. Um, the new Pi camera, I've, um, as you know, I am one of these people with one of these Raspberry Pis that doesn't do very much. And I've yes, I've had more than one, but I have bought the number yeah. four and I'm now inspired to do something with that. But the new Good. Pi camera, I saw in a notice that they've just launched really quite a Wizzo camera, I believe. Do you know anything about this? Have you tried it? Uh, I've got one here, yeah. Um, it's the Pi high-definition camera, high-resolution camera. Um, yeah, so it's a lot more expensive. Um, you can put um, interchangeable lenses on it. It's got a C-mount, so it takes all the standard closed-circuit TV lenses so they're relatively cheap for glass lenses and all the rest of it. So you've got more control over the image like that. So um, roughly the cost of the camera is about £50, I think I saw. Is that it, right? Yeah, it is. Yeah. Which for Raspberry Pi is quite expensive, relatively speaking. Yeah, <laughs> yeah it is. Yeah, yeah. Um, I, I wanted to use it for high-res video, but it won't do that. Um, <laughs> so is that better um, for high-res still frames then or, or yeah. maybe robotics or something like that? Yeah, yeah. Or you could do t you could do great time lapse with it, things like that. Yeah. Okay. I, I use um, I use the Pi cameras a lot. I've got um, we've got hedgehogs in the garden, and I've got a little uh, Pi camera set up on a Raspberry Pi, and it's an infrared camera, and I've got a little infrared light next to it, so I can watch the hedgehogs every night, which is quite nice. And I've also got house security system uses Raspberry Pi and. Um, it uses some Pi cameras, but it uses some um, Daifeng ones that I've hacked as well. Oh, that, that, that's a really good. One of the questions actually I was going to ask you was, what is your own personal favourite application of the Pi? Ah, goodness me. Well, I like using it as an SDR receiver, to be honest. Um, but I, I like tinkering. <laughs> <laughs> most of my amateur radio interest is in not so much spending time on air as spending time making things that will go on air and it's almost an anticlimax after that they've worked so i need something else to do <laughs> so you're a true experimenter i mean that's at the heart of our hobby that's though, what i like it? doing i've had rachel yeah, m1ayg just ask is four gig enough and i guess that's the memory of the pie so i don't know exactly when yeah, she asked is. that that was just before nine in fact so yeah it's more than enough uh, i meant to say that during the presentation actually uh the pie uses very much very little of that ram so if you look um with those uh, sdr programs running and um wsjtx running when I checked it, it was using about 300 megs of RAM. That's all. Um, so, so it really is. Then. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I, in fact, if you're using the 32-bit operating system, it can't actually use all of a 4 gig memory. Um, so the 8 gig one is really only any use if you go 64-bit. Um, and you said and that's coming, it's didn't really, you? It's coming, yeah, but it's mainly going to be of use to people who are doing graphics-intensive work um, or heavy computational stuff where you need lots of RAM. For none of the amateur radio programs that I'm aware of, excluding TV ones, there might be a case for TV ones, um, they don't use very much memory at all. and You're fine with the standard 2-gig board. That's enough. Okay, good. Uh, John M six DXI said, "I thought you. I thought he thought you heard you say that you can use the Pi as a TNC. Is that right?" Yeah. Instead of yeah, you don't don't need a TNC. Um, if you're doing packet radio, if you if you load Direwolf software on it, uh, it does everything that a TNC does. Okay, good. Well, I think we've virtually exhausted all the questions. By the way, as well as the questions, there were lots of compliments and thanks and. Uh, excellent presentation okay. and everything for you so um you did really well tonight mike thank you very much indeed okay. again for tonight um, that book as well we mentioned the raspberry pi explained is your book available from the rsgb bookshop as well uh, but for now mike i think just in case we've got any other questions here i don't think we do so well um, i'm quite happy for you to email them on if you want me to answer any more okay that's brilliant all right well mike uh once again, thank you ever so much for tonight's talk, uh, because that does end okay. this first tonight at eight. And um, on everybody who's watching behalf, I'd like to thank 
Mike Riches, G4WNC, for such an enlightening and inspiring talk. And as I said, don't forget you can get Mike's latest book, It's Raspberry Pi Explained, now from the RSGB Bookshop, which is at www.rsgbshop.org. So we hope you've enjoyed tonight's webinar. And if you'd like to see details of future webinars or send any comments or feedback, please visit www.rsgb.org forward slash webinars. But until next time, this is David G7RP signing off and clear. Bye-bye.